Hello. Hello, good morning. We're getting a lovely lot of people coming through. Hello. Hi there. Right. Hello. Really, really lovely to see you. Really nice to see a mixture of old friends and new faces here today. Um, welcome to our new style temporary solution online virtual alternative um, to a day in an actual field. Um, hopefully the upside of not being too concerned about the weather, although it would have been perfect, I've got to say, not having had to drive here and getting to see more than one farm at a time and can go some way towards balancing out the fact that you are actually going to have to make your own tepid cup of tea and we're all missing our seasonal field day fixes which at the end of the day is really quite a part of why we all do what we do do. Um, I'm going to start um, with a quick poll just to get a feel for who's here and what your interests are. Um, we've got around 60, um, oh, polls. My, my poll's not working. We're not gonna do a quick poll. I don't know if one of the other co-hosts would like to check if the polls can work from theirs. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, we've got around 60 people with us today. Um, and I'm gonna run through a little bit of housekeeping just to start with. Um, so this is being recorded, so by sticking around, you're consenting to that. So this is being recorded, um, and a recording will be available afterwards if you want to look at it or refer to it. Um, in the very unlikely event that we are gatecrashed, um, I'll end the meeting and we'll rearrange it for another time. There are two basis points attached to this event. To claim them, please type in your number, so your 200 number, um, and your name uh, into the chat and you can direct that just to myself or just the organisers. Um, we will definitely be done by one because my boss needs the Zoom account at that time so I can promise you it will be over by then. Right, so Integrated Pest Management, IPM. So Integrated Pest Management has always been a key to LEAF uh, since 1991 when, when we were um, first conceived. Um, it's a fundamental principle of the crop health and protection aspect of integrated farm management, IFM, and it's also a lovely tongue twister of a sister acronym to try and fit into the same conversation, which we do quite often. So the 2020 LEAF Global Impacts Report found that 52% of LEAF Mark farms were demonstrating best practice in all eight areas of I IPM. And the principle of continuous improvement within both the standard and of course the IFN mindset really drives all including these 52% to keep moving in a positive direction on this. So practical, realistic and achievable solutions are what we at LEAF are into as many of you will know. So a really quick recap is that those eight areas of IPM that we're defining here today um, in a sequence of consideration really are firstly preventing and suppressing the buildup of harmful organisms, monitoring pest populations and forecasting their impact, the use of thresholds to determine when to intervene, fourthly considering all options for pest control including non-chemical, fifth selection of appropriate intervention considering all the potential risks involved, sixth minimizing chemical use by maximizing efficiency of application, Seven, strategizing to prevent the buildup and resistance in pest populations. And eight, reviewing the success of a stroke chosen strategy. The overriding principle of, of all that, as ever, um, is that no one of these stands alone, but combines um, all available strategies, so including informed inaction um, to find the most appropriate solution for the system in a given circumstance. So, the publication last week of the latest in our Simply Sustainable series. Here we go. Latest one, fifth in the fifth in a row, um, is Simply Sustainable IPM. Um, and you should, you should be able to access this from the email that I sent um, following registration last night. I think I sent out an email to everybody who'd registered by last night. You can also get to it through our website, obviously. Um, so today we are together here to look at IPM specifically in arable farming. So it's a hot topic, I know you will agree, that's why you're here. We've got actives falling away, 
Um, it's really not hard to think of some notable examples from just very recently, so clopyrifos, clofianidin, chlorothalonil, and they're just the seed. They're just the ones beginning with C. We, we, you know, these things are falling away fast. Um, but the pressure to produce food, energy, and feed is, is undiminished. So there's really never been a more prescient time than now to get all the remaining tools in the box oiled up and working together. We've got a lot of great examples of IPM and um, really slickly operating in horticulture. Um, we've got protected cropping with tried and tested biological control systems um, involving the release of beneficial insects to predate on a captive audience within controlled climates to maintain the high value of salad and fruit crops. But out in the fields, with more variables at play and crop values spread thinner across the land, the challenges of establishing robust IPM strategies are undeniably even more complex. I believe that every farmer is practicing IPM to some degree and that that's what farming is. It's putting together the available pieces in the best way possible for crop health and protection. So choosing disease resistant varieties from the recommended lists, having in place a basic rotation, cultivation, timing based on weed seed germination, they're all part of the story of IPM. But there are, there's pioneers as well. There's, there's innovatives and forward thinking growers and researchers all across this country, all across the world right now, who are driving forwards our understanding of the systems we all work within and finding solutions to both very old and very new problems with a real view to the long game. So I'm more than delighted to be bringing together today four agriculturalists who are really taking forward the practice of IPM in UK arable. All are linked with LEAF through their work in this area, research, practice, demonstration, development, and as ever in IFM, we believe that these complementary elements of a system make for even more than the sum of their parts through integration with each other. So first up we have Alice the Leek, so farm manager of the 333 hectare Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust Allerton Project Farm at Loddington in Leicestershire, where over 25 years of combining commercial cropping with environmental focus, the project has really learned a thing or two about IPM and as a LEAF Innovation Centre works hard to share that knowledge with the network, continuing to develop and inform best practice across the sector. So, Alistair, can you share your screen with us? Whilst Alistair's doing that, Lucy, the, the poll did run, so I think, um, I'm not sure if people can see the results yeah, there. Katie, well done. Are people able to see that? Personally, I can't see it, but as long as we've got the, um, if anyone else can, has I can, I can see it. Yay! <laughs> so, yeah, we've got um, advisors, researchers, farmers, yeah, a real mixed bag in here today, so. Hi, everyone. Right, over to Alistair. It looks like you've got a screen share on our hands. Okay, good morning, everybody. And can I just check with you, Lucy, that you're seeing my front slide there? Alistair. That's great, thank you very much. Good morning everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to give the first slot in this uh, uh, series of presentations. Uh, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust have been working on farmland ecology for over 50 years now and during that time we've built up a huge uh, experience of, of how to, to deal with, uh, with pest problems without having to resort to, to chemicals. Uh, but before we, we look forward let's uh, start by just looking back and has that taken me to the next screen? No, we haven't been done yet. Yes. So this is a landmark paper in integrated pest management published in 1959, where American researchers in California found better control of the spotted alfalfa aphid when they used a half dose of insecticide. And rather puzzled by this during an era when uh, greater kill tended to be achieved by greater doses, uh, they investigated further and, and discovered the role of biological control in helping to control those pest species. 
And this is uh, beautifully exemplified by the great entomologist Helmut van Emden in his book Beyond Silent Spring, when he sets out the relationship between pest and prey. So if you look at the top box there, which is unsprayed, you would tip typically find one predator species to every three pest species. Uh, and in normal agricultural circumstances, that would present a problem for the farmer because the pests are getting the better hand and probably going to cost him money. But what they found was that when they went in and sprayed with a non-selective pesticide, because the pests are able to recover more quickly than the predators are, it actually shifts the advantage to the pest. And we get into a system which we'd call the pesticide treadmill, where we have to then continually spray to keep on top of the pest because the predators are no longer able to do that. However, if we're able to use a selective pesticide, and we can do that through the chemical mode of action, or indeed by modifying the dose of the pesticide, which is exactly what the Hilgardia paper reported on, we can actually shift the balance in favour of the predator. And this is good news because actually, if we were to eliminate the, the, the pest species altogether, we obviously eliminate the food for the predator too. So shifting the balance in favour of the predator, and of course, in the process, in favour of the farmer, we can achieve this balance. And I think this is the challenge which we face going forward. So out there on our farms, there are a whole host of goodies that are all there to help us. But of course, a lot of the time, we don't know what they are. Uh, these are the ones which run along the ground and are active uh, uh, in that space. And then we have another group which, which can fly in or travel in and get into the middle of the, into the crops. And there's a whole range of predators and parasites uh, in, in those groups that will help us to control our pests. And I'm pleased to say that we, we now have an encyclopedia produced by AHDB of what those actually are. And while I'm sat here talking to you on my desk, I have a large green book called the UK Pesticides Guide. And it's got everything in there that I can use to spray my crops with. And I think really, although I know that guide as an agronomist pretty well, I really need to know my encyclopedia of pests and natural enemies equally well, if I'm going to be able to make the two systems work together. And there's another very user-friendly uh, piece of work which was funded by the Frank Parkinson Trust and carried out by my team at the Allison Project uh, as part of the Agricology Project, which goes through uh, biological control mechanisms of crop pests. So let's have a look at some of the science that we've come across in the field. And of course, one of the fundamental things to growing arable crops is the cultivations that we employ. And I take you now to an aerial shot of some plots of wheat being grown using three different tillage systems, uh, plowing, uh, min-till and zero-till. And if you look at about 10 o'clock on this diagram, you'll see an outside plot which is very yellow and the plot next to it which is very green. Uh, the outside plot is a plowed plot and the yellow that you can see there is barley yellow dwarf virus infection, which has been brought in by aphids migrating into the crop in the autumn, feeding on the plants and spreading the virus. Next to it, the green plot is a zero-tilled plot where you can see the infection rates are incredibly low. So the question was, why on earth are those aphids finding the, 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 the plow plot plants but, but not the zero-tilled ones? To begin with, we, we thought it had something to do with the trash on the surface, um, that the aphids were finding it hard to recognise the green shoots of the wheat coming through uh, because of that trash, and it was simply a, a recognition factor. But, but John Holland, my, my entomologist colleague, challenged that many years later and said that he thought it was probably to do with spiders. And when we think about it, and we go back to that original slide, we can see that because of the stubble and the amount of trash, we've got a lot more structure for a spider to be able to spin a web on than we have in a plough system where it's very, very smooth. And in fact, if you look in a, in a growing crop, as this uh, slide shows, uh, you can see in this case, we've got orange blossom midge, which is quite clearly got caught up in the spider's web. And I suspect orange blossom midge not being a very good flyer, just as aphids are not good flyers, um, 
they, um, they're encountering these webs and, and getting tied up. So there's a great advantage for us to try and use natural enemies. And of course, if we're going to spray, we, we may well end up using um, sprays like pyrethroids, which are very damaging to spider, spiders. And that puts us back on this pesticide treadmill that I was talking about at the outset. So let's now have a look at the problem we have with the oilseed rape. Uh, there's a little germinating oilseed rape seedling and you can see the little cotyledons at the top covered in the seed coat which was a neonicotinoid insecticide which of course we can no longer use anymore and as you know many farmers now are struggling to grow this crop. The uh, weevil <coughs> lays its eggs and the larvae hatch and bore into the stem causing uh, serious problems and in many cases crop loss. We wanted to know if spiders could be helpful in autumn sown oilseed rape in controlling cabbage stem flea beetle. So we went out with this machine which is like a big Dyson that you put on your back, sucks the insects out of the crops. We've been using these for 50 years to sample and we went into a field of oil, autumn sown uh, oilseed rape and we sucked the insects out and we analysed them. So what you have here is, is three bar charts. On the right hand side, plough. The, in the middle you've got mintil and on the left you've got light till. And we're particularly interested in the spider group which is denoted by arony or the uh, brown box. Uh, if you look on the right hand side, you can see just above the blue there, a thin line showing a very few number of spiders. On the mintil it's looking probably sizely better, about 10 times as many but certainly we're finding a great deal more in the light till. So then we're interested in the two pest species which uh, infect the rape, uh, and these are denoted by the yellow and the light blue box. So if we go back to the right-hand side uh, bar chart, you'll see that we have both those species present, denoted by yellow and blue. Um, in the mint till, we have more blue than yellow, but still have the pest problem. But to our amazement, when we got into the light till plots, we couldn't find any of those problems. And I think that's a really encouraging thing to come up with because that is supporting the work that we, we did all those years ago on barley yellow dwarf virus and does seem to support the idea that spiders can be helpful in this matter. Well of course that is only one year's result and, and we need to be able to repeat this and so the following year did, we did the same uh, trial again uh, but unfortunately in that season the spiders didn't turn up for work. And I think this is the problem with biological control at the moment. We need to definitely be able to add more certainty to it. So you'll have been reading about insectageddon and the demise of insects. Well, we've got a good handle on this. We've been sucking insects out of the same hundred fields in Sussex now for over 50 years. We can track the impact of the carbamates, the organophosphates, the organochlorines, and even now the neonicotinoids on the insect populations. And, and it's not all bad news, but I don't of course have time today to go through all of it. Uh, this is an interesting slide and I, I flagged this up because actually we are now finding four times more beetles as we were back at the start of that study in the 1970s. So that's actually good news for insect numbers. But you can see that the vast majority of those are made up from a couple of single species. And that has to be of concern because in a good and well-functioning ecological system, you really need a great deal of diversity. And the less diversity you have, probably the less well-functioning that system is. So we really need to get a balance between quantities and species distribution to be sure that we're going in the right direction. So what we, can we do as farmers? to try to boost our natural enemies. And, and my colleague John's come up with this little an acronym, shelter, alternative play, floral resources, and the environment, and how we actually manage that. And if we put those together, this can provide the backbone to an inter integrated pest management management system. And of course, a key component of this is, is, is beetle banks and something we've done a huge amount of, of work on. Um, having excavated these banks in winter time to find out if they really are used for beetles for overwintering, we find that up to 1300 beetles per square meter 
are overwintering in these banks. And of course, when spring comes, these beetles head out into the field looking for something to eat, and you have your ready-made IPM agent out there working for you. And this shows you typically what happens when those beetles move out. So if you start at the left-hand side of this graph, the beetles come out of the beetle bank and they go out into the field looking for the aphids as they fly in. Because they're there already, they're able to suppress the breeding cycle of those aphids and keep them under control right the way through the season. Whereas if the, if the predators aren't there on arrival, the aphids get rapidly established, they start to breed, they go over the threshold for economic damage, the farmer has to spray, and in the process he will kill many of the beneficials that were helping him to control the problem. So this demonstrates clearly how useful this can be. And I can only say, I arrived here at the Allerton Project in 2001, uh, and the Beetle Bank arrangement here was put in in 1993. And during that entire time up to this year, we have not had to use a summer aphicide on our cereal crops. Now, I fully appreciate that a summer aphicide is not always required on cereal crops, but in this area, in those 25 plus years, at least seven years, other farmers around here have sprayed, whereas we have not had to. So I think that's an indication that something here is working. And we don't have to do just special things like beetle banks. There's a whole load of things that we can put around our field margins, which are the lowest yielding part of the field anyway, uh, to help achieve those safe objectives that we want. And we can do things in the middle of the field too, so there's a range of options there as well, but I'll just allude to the slide in the bottom left-hand corner, which shows some barley being grown as a row crop. Now, this is incredibly useful because actually we can introduce beneficial plants as an understory into this to provide alternative food for, 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 for insects. But more particularly, that open structure is fantastic for farmland birds to be able to forage in because they really struggle to forage in our thick crops. So by changing the crop architecture, we can help both biodiversity and our own management of pests and the crop. So here is a little score chart which looks at those safe objectives and what each one of the measures or the habitat types down the left hand side has to offer. And if it's very bright green, it quite clearly is very useful. Uh, and if it's yellow, less, less so. So now you can start to use some of these habitats in your landscape to try to improve your levels of IPM. And we can do exactly the same with weed species. Some are really good for beneficials and some are less so, and some we really don't want to see. Interestingly, the ones we really don't want to see are actually not very good for insects either. Um, so that's pretty, pretty good news for us. And, and I have to say, that this, this is a photo I took many years ago in one of my fields. Um, I was sampling in this field and we'd got an outbreak of poppies. Uh, what I noticed when I went into this field was just how alive it was. It was literally buzzing with insects, full of life, whereas most winter wheat fields I go into are absolutely dead. Now, of course, there's a balance to be had here, and we all know the adage of one year seeding, seven years weeding. So we do have to keep on top of these weeds. Uh, it's important to do so, but perhaps we don't need to be quite as severe as we have been in the past, particularly with those weeds which are more friendly. So finally, what can we do with environmental stewardship to help support that? And, and I think there's a great deal we can do. And this next sequence of four slides just quickly shows you uh, how we do that. So you have here a field which has been yield mapped and we can see quite clearly that the outsides of this field are not yielding very well. And if we look at the stewardship options, financially, we might be better off to take them out of production and put them in, into those options, remembering that the options that we choose will also help us with the agronomy of the crop we're growing in the middle of the field. So we can put a watercourse buffer here along the bottom against that ditch and that will give us 512 pounds a hectare and we can put some wild seed bird seed mix up this side and it'll give us 640 uh, pounds a hectare and we can put a flower rich habitat down the other two sides giving us 539 pounds a hectare but 
that's not going to do too well because there's a tall hedge alongside that so we can put in to lay the hedge and that will let the sunlight into those uh, those flowers and we get paid for that as well and if we got a black grass problem in the middle of the field we could possibly take that out and put it into a herbal lay to to get some restoration there so so there's a whole load of options which are going to help to improve the ecology of the farm which we can get paid to do and uh, my penultimate slide uh, I've been asked just to say a few words about the program of agroecology there's a load of stuff going on with this initiative all of it supportive of IPM you can see there the program which is coming up with the virtual uh, field days do go on to the agroecology website and uh, and have a look what's going on I'm sure you'll find it of of, of interest and um, Thank you very much. Uh, and any questions of clarification, I'll be happy to take. Thank you very much, Alistair. That's fantastic. Um, it's really great to be able to benefit from the experience of and really the mounting em evidence from the long term research that, that you've been conducting at Loddington and Sussex. Um, Emily, do you have any questions for Alistair? Come through the chat. Uh, yes, there's one from Lynn Batten saying, Does the does the bank around the field also provide a habitat for other more harmful insects, not just beetles? Sorry. Um, well, yes, we've had a lot of discussion about this. Uh, farmers are actually more worried about ergot coming from perennial grasses in these strips. Um, so, but actually, rather than harmful things, um, good things. Uh, field mice use the, the, the bank for their burrows. Uh, we see raptors hunting the, the field mice along the bank. And when they've eaten them, the bumblebees move into the holes left behind by the field mice and they come out and pollinate the crops. We get four times more harvest mice growing on these strips than we find in, in normal field margins. So, um, more benefits than I alluded to rather than there being problems uh, but the ergot one is one that has been flagged. Thank you very much Alistair, that's fantastic. Um, in regards to weeds, I just noticed a, a point here on the chat, so Chloe McLaren at Rothamsted had some interesting results showing that greater diversity of weeds resulted in significantly less impact on yields than where there was less weed diversity in dominant weeds, partially due to beneficial role in habitats for um, beneficial insects. So I think it's just highlighting the complexity of that, of, of that system. I think that's, that's kind of one of the real themes in IPM coming out here. And of course, in an arable system, um, in, in increased um, complexity is kind of what we're working with, as well as in some ways against, I guess. Um, Okay, Alistair, can you unshare your screen, please? Yeah, I hope I've done that now. I'm still seeing your screen. Ah, right. <laughs> Stop participating. I think I can unshare you. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, so, next up, we have James Loder Simmons, who, in a really unusually, I think it's fair to say, public seven days, and um, this time pretty much exactly last week. Uh, was with his wife Emma launching their 1250 hectare family farm in Kent as the most recent and 41st member of the Leaf Demonstration Farm Network. Um, under the banner of Learn, Grow and Protect, they're putting in strategies placed across the rotation addressing all the eight principles of IPM. So I'm going to hand over to you James and then when you say we will share the video. Okay. Thank you, Lucy. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be uh, joining you on this uh, LEAF Integrated Pest Management meeting and uh, looking forward to an interesting discussion. As um, Lucy mentioned, we are the new kids on the block. Uh, in terms of being a LEAF demonstration farm, we're um, number 41. Um, I think today's meeting typifies why we joined the LEAF Demonstration Network because the main driver I find behind it all is the attitude to solve problems that we face through research and information but we're all happy to share it with one another to find solutions which I think is quite unusual if you're looking across other industries and today to me shows that. Um, what I'm going to go and show you in a minute is a short film 
and show you a little bit about our business and then some examples of integrated um, pest management. Um, it does come with a warning that we are um, farmers and not filmmakers, so please bear with us if, you're, um, also if your internet is a bit slow. But um, anyway, if you watch the film and then I will take some questions after that. Over to you, Lucy. Okay. So if there's any issues with the sound here, please just tell me on the chat because I can't hear it from my end. Is that showing for everybody? Monison Farms is a 3,000 acre arable business. It's our own land and then we have five other contract farming clients and we treat it all as one. We have two layers to our business. We have the first layer, which is the, the contracting side, the operational side. So from drilling the seed through to storing the, um, the crops. And then the second layer is using Emma and my expertise. I am an agronomist and Emma is a land agent and we offer the management expertise such as budgeting management accounts, doing the BPS forms and implementing countryside stewardship agreements, just um, to name a few. Our main thing is to maximise the returns to our clients at the same time in enhancing the environment um, that we um, work within. This approach has led us to um, LEAF and integrated farm management whereby we're producing food sustainably and looking after the environment that we um, manage. We aim to maximise our returns, um, not only to ourselves, but also to our clients through reducing our costs. And benchmarking's really been an invaluable tool um, to do this. We've used our management expertise in terms of um, varietal resistance uh, and rotations. Um, to minimise the amount of inputs we have to, to put on and then we add value through the leaf mark. I'm delighted to be in, uh, involved in the integrated pest management um, discussion today. Integrated pest management is becoming more and more important as we've seen just in the last year of the banning of near nick seed dressings in winter wheat. So this has meant that we've got to find alternative ways to grow these crops and to control the pest. So as a business we set ourselves quite a, a high target of reducing our insecticide use by 50% this year and we're on target to do that. And what I'm going to do now is take you around the farm and show you the various measures we've put in place and how we've managed to achieve that. Of all the crops in the arable rotation in terms of integrated pest management, the one crop that where the importance of IPM is so important is Olsey Brave. Olsey Brave as a break crop is so important in an arable rotation and this is under threat. Just to give you an idea of the numbers this year in the UK we need two million tonnes of Olsey Brave and we're only we're going to produce south of one million tonnes and ever since the um, ban on neonic seed dressings the um, prevalence of pest called flea beetle has become more and more of a problem and annually the damage is going up. So we've had to look at this problem and go back to, to basics so to speak and we've looked at the practice called companion cropping whereby it encourages the um, flea beetle to eat the companion crop rather than the Aussie grape crop. And what the flea beetle does, it actually eats the cotyledons leaves initially and then after that the larvae bore into the plant and it either dwarfs the plant or the, when it matures it actually physically snaps off. And this year we've seen certainly around um, our area sort of 15-20% of the crop has been decimated by flea beetle. So we've tried clover with our Aussie break mix last autumn and it's had a definitely had a beneficial effect but I I think what we need to look at in terms of integrated pest management is not just one silver bullet that's going to solve the problem there's many things and I think companion cropping definitely does have a future 
but we've got to consider all the other aspects such as um, looking after soil management, ensuring that the fertility levels are high, looking at um, vigorous um, varieties, rotation in terms of extending the rotation of rape, um, just to name a few. And using all these options together, then I think there is a future for growing rape, but it is, it is quite a challenge at the moment. A bit of our uh, piece of our fleet of machinery. This is our Rogator Fent 655 36 meter sprayer. And this has basically meant that we've improved our efficiencies across the business. We've um, increased the boom width from 30 to 36 meters. We've also, um, it's linked to a satellite, RTK, so that you basically minimize the amount of chemical that you're using because all you apply is the chemical that's actually required on that particular part of the field because it goes round the headland and then it maps it and then when you're going up and down to the rest of the field it basically shuts on and off automatically so basically meaning you only put the chemical where it's required so you're saving money and environmentally you're not um, over spraying here we've got an example of a beetle bank um, it's not the best example, I must admit, but we're um, going to re-improve it, re-drill it next year um, and probably put in a more exciting mix. But we're always learning and um, improving things along as, as we go along. The idea of a beetle bank, again, is this, this thing of um, connectivity and a mosaic of different habitats running through the farm and it's connecting a hedge behind me and um, a field, uh, sorry, a, a, a woodland over there. But the other thing, I mean, I know it's called a beetle bank, but it's also a great habitat for things like lacewings, ladybirds. Of course, these are um, natural predators of, of aphids, so um, can help us in, in that way. And that's a really good example for us of integrated pest management, which we try and do. It avoids spraying the fields, it keeps the beekeepers happy, and it means that we can reduce our costs as well. Uh, winter barley, feed barley. I wanted to br uh, bring you here because this is an example of us using techn uh, technology to um, make advancements of um, reducing the need for um, pesticides. This variety is called KWS Amistar and it's a BYDV tolerant variety. Um, for you who don't know what that is, it's barley yellow dwarf virus which is uh, um, transferred by aphids in the autumn and it can reduce the um, yield significantly, at least over half if it is infected. So breeders have used characteristics to create this tolerance within it and it means that we it reduces the need to use insecticides in the autumn, which I'm all passionate for in terms of an environmental point of view, but there's also a cost saving as well. That brings us to the end of the um, virtual farm tour. Hopefully it's given you a flavour of, of, of the farm and of the examples of integrated pest management that we're doing. For the future, we are increasing our countryside stewardship area from 10 to 15%, so that will give a lot more habitat for natural predators to play their part in the control of pests such as aphids. Uh, and then we're looking to expand on our companion cropping uh, in Aussie break. We're going to try mustard this year. So the challenge is there. Um, we're up for the challenge and we're going to keep trying different things to overcome it. Fantastic. Thank you um, very much, James. That was brilliant. Um, now, for me, what really shines through in that is alongside the principles of IPM, we've got the principles of IFM as well. So attention to detail, continuous improvement, and site-specific solutions. So a uh, lovely job and great filming. Um, I particularly enjoyed looking at your oilseed rape crop there, um, a rare breed in this part of the world. I don't know about where you are. Um, as you say, it's a domestic crop that we're looking at increasingly importing oils and proteins to replace if we can't find new ways of growing it. Can you say a little bit more about which other methods you use to complement and support the companion cropping that you were talking about just then? I think um, this year we really tried to 
go after this sort of full bore of trying to resolve the issue with flea beetle because as we've seen other parts of the country it's decimated crops in kent as a county it's becoming more and more of a problem the numbers are increasing um so last autumn we actually changed our cultivation system down to our new agronomist who's keen to try things so we traditionally we were a drill and then um, or subsoil cultivate and drill so there was obviously a cost element to that but the main thing that we were seeing was that we were losing moisture so what we then changed to was literally a one pass system with a karat which is a heavy set of discs with a stock seeder on the back so literally into the ground work it and then the soil is um, drilled sealed and then rolled twice because the rolling helps um, prevent the um, flea beetle from working the top layer of the soil and we've seen a tremendous benefit of that on the chalk in particular we've rolled it twice so I, I would say cultivation techniques Lucy have been one thing we've noticed an enormous benefit this year. Thank you Harold combination of strategies. Um, thank you very much James. Um, next up we've got Ben Woodcock. So ecological entomology is your field Ben and my understanding of this in a farmland setting is really how we work together with insects to get a positive outcome for all except possibly the aphids. Um, it's a really complicated landscape, as a previous questioner mentioned, um, of pros and cons really out there, and the development of land management approaches that provide more ecosystem services than disservices to arable crop health in particular and protection is no small task. Um, so plan A to, for today was to be looking in real life at the field trials that Ben is running for the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology, so CEH, as part of the long-term national capability assist project so assist stands for achieving sustainable agricultural systems and who doesn't want that the trials are located on the chamberlain family's 760 hectare oxfordshire leaf demonstration farm chromos buckle farm um, and i'm really pleased that not only is alice midmer with us today whose bright idea this was in the first place um, but also two Chamberlains, Charlie and Tim, are here on the call with us and they're able to enjoy the benefits of the conversation without actually having had to park us all anywhere. So um, over to you, Ben. Great, thank you. Right, I'll uh, try and share my screen. Let's go with that one. Right. Wow. And Zach, can everyone see that? Yep, that's good with yes. me. Yes. Blinding. Yeah. Right? Oh, excellent. Right. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me here today to talk. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a shame we can't be out on site, but uh, nonetheless, it's good to be here. So I'm going to talk to you today, as you said, about the, uh, a little bit of, anyway, the ASSIST project, which is Achieving Sustainable Agricultural Systems. Uh, this is quite a big project, uh, and it really kind of revolves around this idea of developing and testing innovative farming systems. And that really comes down to not just this idea of increasing food production or at least profitability, but also creating systems that are resilient to future perturbations while reducing the environmental footprint. Now that's that's quite a broad spectrum, and it's it's a it's a big project. It's kind of five years. It's eleven million pounds of funding, so it's it's a huge amount in there. What I'm going to talk to you today uh, is kind of a relatively small part of it, a specific work package that relates to our large scale field network, which is a whole series of different study farms where we're trying to look at how to implement uh, management systems to promote um, uh, sustainability in the context of arable farming. Really, what are we trying to do when we think about this? Well, it, on a practical level, we're trying to take the best bits of bits of high input farming and the best bits of low intensity, extensive farming systems to maintain yields while reducing environmental impacts. Now, this is something a lot of people are doing, and you've just seen the work on Alice from Alistair at the uh, Game Conservancy Trust, who's again been working in very similar fields. So this is something a lot of people are showing interest in at the moment. Really what it comes down to is this idea of sustainable intensification. It's that integration of biodiversity into intensive farming systems. And what we're aiming to do here really is it's not biodiversity per se, but it's farming specific aspects of biodiversity that we can take advantage of. Particularly in the context of this meat, 
uh, this uh, talk here, pest control, but also pollination, good soil health, protection of water resources. And the way that we achieve that is something that obviously many of you will be familiar with. It's that kind of space efficient multifunctional habitats or more commonly known as fill margins or fill corners. These kind of areas where we can promote biodiversity in areas external to the actual crop and provide those, those beneficial resources that can then permeate into the crop. So why do we think this is going to work? Well, a lot of our evidence comes at CH at least from the uh, Hillston platform, which was a large experiment that was run over a number of years uh, from 2006 to 2011. And um, what this study did was it took a thousand hectare conventional farms that never had any agro-environmental schemes and it split it up into little 50 hectare replicated blocks. And on those replicated blocks, we did three different broad treatments. First one was cross compliance. The second one was an entry level agro environmental scheme. So that's flower rich fill margins, fill corners, taking 3% of land out of production. And the second one was effectively the equivalent, taking 8% of land out of production. Now, this was set up as agro environmental schemes were back then, really to look at benefits of biodiversity. But because we had detailed yield mapping on that site, we could look at long term effects on actual yield. And what we find is that after two to three years of this 3% or 8% of land out production, we start to get increases in yield associated across those, those individual replicated blocks. And that's really related to this increase in these beneficial invertebrates, the pollination, the pest control. And that is, this is taking into account the fact that we've removed land out production with 3%, 8%. Now, that's only one site. And really what the ASSIST project is trying to do is, is look at a larger scale, do we see this consistency across multiple different sites? And it's this idea of promoting natural pest control, promoting pollination, but also good soil health. As I mentioned before, it's farming biodiversity for the benefits to provide you. Obviously, we want to have biodiverse farms, but it's how can we utilize those specific components in the best way possible to maintain profitability and reduce inputs. So really, we're not in the context of this large scale field experiment, we're not doing anything particularly radical. What we're doing is looking at different aggregates of, of existing practices to see how those actively work in the context of modern farming systems. So we've got stuff like augmenting soil health, the, the addition of organic matter and green composted waste or farmyard manure, manure, the use of cover crops again to promote that good soil health. We've also got that the, the, the use of promoting natural pest control and crop pollinator communities by the use of these flower rich fill margins. And very much this is choosing targeted species to deliver specific resources for specific communities. So many of you will be familiar with pollen and nectar mixes. Now those tend to have flowers like clovers in there. They are pretty good for bumblebees, but they're not so amazing for a lot of other species, particularly stuff like parasitic wasps and predators that make use often of pollen and nectar resources. The idea is it's targeted seed mixes to deliver specific resources. And also this idea of getting these beneficial predators and pollinators into the crop. Now, this is, this is really building on, on the, the beetle bank idea, but doing something that's a little bit more diverse in terms of the species communities that are there. But it's building on that, on that legacy that's been developed before. And this comes down to this idea of breaking up big fields. If you've got big fields, fundamentally, it's very easy to increase populations of beneficials on the edges. What's not so easy is getting them into the middle of the fields. And we see that for a lot of groups, bumblebees and a large range of predator species, they tend to have higher densities at the edges of the fields. And it's those higher densities that are likely to be delivering those uh, individual services. Now, this isn't true for all predators, but it is it's a general pattern that you tend to have more individuals at the edges. Now, that can have direct impact on the capacity of those systems to deliver pest control. Now, in this particular study, we compared, uh, we artificially established aphid colonies on wheat, and we compared the survival of those colonies uh, at 10 meters or 50 meters into a field next to flower rich or grass only field margins. And what we find is that when we're close to those flower rich fill margins, those flower rich resources that are supporting parasitoid populations, predators, we get those colonies survive for the shortest period of time. What you can see in this red circle, those grass only margins, they're not as good for this. Now, this is just one study, but what it points to is this importance of trying to maximize spillover. 
So how are we doing this in the context of this project? Well, we've got three management systems and really these can be summarized as a business as usual or probably more likely a, a historic business as usual. I suspect a lot of you are doing more than, than just the kind of bog standard of maybe 10 years ago. We've also got this idea in the second treatment of flower rich fill margins, targeted species compositions to support populations, but also the integration of cover crops within those to help boost or maintain soil health. And then the third treatment is those fill margins to support populations at the edge, the cover crops, the organic matter to support soil health, and then these infilled strips to provide effectively access routes into the crop to help distribute those ecosystem services. Now, very much in the context of this, we need to understand, is this worth it? You know, you're taking agricultural land out of production. And while that might be beneficial for biodiversity, if you're doing this for the specific purpose of increasing uh, the delivery of pollination or pest control, it's important to have that actually quantified. Now, as I said before, we, we have evidence from previous studies that suggest that this may work. But what we want to do is see, does this consistently work? Does it? And if it doesn't work, when does it not work? So what we've got in this, this project is 19 replicated sites where we have each of these treatments established on each site. We have those established in two different tranches. And these are all on conventional farms. And although they're conventional farms in terms of their use of agrochemicals, they across a wide range of different management practices. So this really gives us the opportunity to really burrow into this, to try and understand what's going on when it consistently works. And this is important because as you can see here is our infield strips, this kind of variation on the beetle bank and the, the massive variability that we see in, in both the establishment and also the species composition relating to the timing of establishment, what the underlying uh, soil type, all these little factors that kind of change what goes in there. However, independent of this, we tend to get pretty good establishment after the second year. There tends to be a need for heavy cutting in the first year to try and control those kind of pernicious weeds that build up initially at least. This establishment of the floral community is vital, not just for those pollinators, which I think everyone always thinks about when they think about uh, kind of uh, flower rich fill margins, but also for the predator communities, the parasitoid communities. Here we can see an interaction network from these sites where we've got the establishing floral communities at the bottom, and the gray lines show the feeding relationships between predator groups like hoverflies and parasitoids, and how they are utilizing these key resources within the crop. And it's important to remember, for example, stuff like parasitoids, if they don't get the opportunity to feed on pollen and nectar, the number of eggs that they can lay is dramatically reduced. This can have direct impact on their capacity to provide uh, pest control services. So this is just looking at, this is all very preliminary results from the study, but this is looking at the number of parasitized aphids that we find on wheat crops. And what we find is we get better uh, levels of control in associated with those, those uh, treatments where we've got the augmentation of the predator community because we've sown the, the field margins, but we're also allowing it to get into the crop through these infilled strips. We also see a very similar thing associated with the ground beetle communities, those predatory, predatory groups that are actively feeding or on the, uh, the, the, the soil service. And here we find that we get better pest control. And this is, we use this effectively dummy uh, slugs to assess this, where they, because the, the ground beetles are visual predators, they will actively attack these little uh, plasticine slugs that we create. And we can look at attack rates of these. And what we can see here is greater attack rates associated with those, that, those infill strips, those fill margins. Now, another really important thing, and Alistair touched on this a little bit, is this importance of diversity in its capacity to provide resilience to farming systems. And one of the things that relates to this is a lot of species respond to different ways to different agrochemicals. Now, while the use of uh, a pyrethroid may have a direct negative impact by actively killing uh, predators, it also has a sublethal effect. There's a residual level left on the surface, and a lot of individuals won't actually be killed, but they'll be exposed to low levels of the insecticide. Now, what we find is that not all species respond in the same way. Now, here we've got a list of very common species, and we're looking at their predation rates on aphids. One day after exposure to a sublethal uh, pyrethroid um, exposure, and five days after exposure. And what we find is massive variation. For some species, 
they're utterly unaffected. Their predation rates remain the same uh, one day after exposure or five days after exposure. For other species, we see an immediate depression in their capacity to control pests, but they bounce back pretty quickly. And for some species, they get a knockback and they tend to stay back. And that's really important because what you effectively have by creating a diversity of predatory species in your agricultural land is you get an averaging effect across all these species. So while you may get a depression in pest control in relation to your management practices from one species, if you've got a diverse community, you can get better pest control. And this relates quite interestingly back to something that Alistair was saying earlier on about this shift in community. When you get dominance of one species, they're particularly susceptible to this resilience issue. So as I said, those are some of the kind of very preliminary kind of results and findings from the uh, study. It was squeezed into kind of 10, 12 minutes. But just kind of some, some kind of final thoughts. It, it's very much, it's probably unrealistic going into the future to consider feeding the world without the use of agrochemicals. They are, they are integral for most modern agricultural systems, but those current results, current uses is likely unsustainably high. And that unsustainably high is probably more of an issue from the perception of the general public. And that's likely to lead in the future to increased regulation. And we see that already, and we've seen that in other countries. You've got um, dramatic shifts, for example, in the case of the Netherlands, where they were to actively remove ingredients. But you've also got that need to control or to predict for the case of resistant buildup. We can only see this in, for example, in black grass, where you've had that massive shift towards the need for cultural control methods. We need to future-proof our agricultural systems. At the moment, insecticides may be so cheap as to mean, why would you not use them? But in the future, we need to have our systems ready. And very much what we've seen here from our results, and I suspect from other studies as well, is that actually it takes time for natural pest control to build up. Three, four years. You do not get it instantly. So we need to, to think about this, build up these populations going into the future. And very much it's projects like ASSIST and other projects that we'll probably be talking about today that are trying to develop those management practices to provide you with the tools to deliver the best pest control in the context of what a fundamentally very variable arable agricultural system. So thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you, Ben. Um, it's really cool to see conservation biological control being like progressed and validated for field scale IPM in this way as, as one aspect of an integrated system and really one that's also integrated with current systems that are doing such a good job and um, building on what, what we do do already and I think just raising it as a st strategic experiment so it says a lot about, about the importance of this um, work. So, uh, could you? I've got a question on the chat. Emily, can you see a question on the chat there? Yeah, just a question saying, can you elaborate a bit more on the change in regulation in the Netherlands in terms of creating sustainable agricultural system? I, I'm not going to lie to you. No, I can't. I just know it's an example. I, the, the situation that, that I, I find quite worrying is, is that these removal of plant protection projects is actively occurring. Everyone knows that this has happened and is likely to go on going on into the future. I suspect that the situations that we had in France, they failed to achieve this with the, the kind of, they wanted to shift a very low uh, insecticide use. And again, in Netherlands, a very similar situation, although I don't really know the details of this. I doubt that's going to happen in the context of the UK, but it doesn't negate the fact that going into the future, the, the prevalence, for example, of an insecticide tax, making them less economical or reduction in your capacity to actually apply numbers of active ingredients means that if you can get ahead of the curve here and have in place already high uh, populations of natural pest control through the, the provision of these, these, uh, these, these kind of created semi-natural habitats, that is likely to put you into a good position. And, and I think very much it's the kind of forward thinking farmers that you see in LEAF that are, are, are trying to do this, have been doing this anyway. But it's, as I said, it's getting ahead of the curve and having this in place to future proof your system. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Ben. That's amazing. Um, we're going to be speaking more after all the presentations about these things. Um, so, last but not least, um, to present to us, we've got Mark Ramsden, who's joining us from ADAS, 
where among other things he's heading up the UK contribution to the Horizon 2020 project IPM decision. And this is this project's working to accelerate the impact of the really amazing actually um, range of increasingly sophisticated decision support data and tools and resources that create a pan-European one-stop shop. The goal is to create a pan-European one-stop shop online platform and decisions network to, to guide farmers and agronomists in, in making informed decisions. And Leaf are long-term collaborators with ADAS in the area of IPM. Um, and Leaf Mark actually features as a best practice case study in their recent report to DEFRA um, reviewing the current UK IPM landscape. I was delighted to see when I read it yesterday. Um, we're going to run a quick poll now if we can. Katie, do you feel able to do that? And this is for Mark and he's going to revisit it during his talk. Is that working for people? Yeah, I can see that come up. <coughs> So, um, excuse me, as Lucy says, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, during the, the presentation, um, but it's really just asking what you think is limiting the use of decision support systems. And just to clarify, uh, by decision support system, um, I'm really referring to things like um, pest forecasting systems or uh, thresholds or observation maps or anything like that that helps give you an idea of how likely pests are to turn up and how much damage they're likely to cause to a crop. So. Um, just you can click multiple options if you think they're all limiting and um, why you may or may not use such a system uh, then, then click all of them but just click the ones you think are most likely to be uh, to limiting use uh, and like I say I'll come back to that during the presentation. Um, and Mark are you share... okay to share your screen and do the presentation? Yep sure uh, wow. bear with me. And I'll just make sure I share the right screen. Oh, no, I can't. You, I'm not able to do that. Right, let me do mine then. Uh, and okay, just you... is this working for you? Not yet. Okay. So can you can everyone see this first screen of Mark's slide? Not yet, no. sorry. Oh. And so what I'll be talking about is um, first of all what decision support systems are and then where you can find them. And, and that really will focus on the um, the EU project that we, we started a year ago uh, and we're running for a few more years, um, which is the one that, that Lucy referred to. Um, and just to kind of fill in where, who I am. Um, so as Lucy said, I'm uh, Mark Ramston. I'm an entomologist at ADAS. Some of you may have come across me before um, if you were involved in the Yield Enhancement Network. Sorry, Lucy, I've just requested a few trials. Yeah, you're welcome to it right now, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, you may have come across me in that, in that um, vein in the past, but, but my focus is really on entomology and IPM, uh, and particularly working with beneficial insects. Um, just before we go on, I just wanted to, uh, to make this point, and it, it kind of goes back to what the other speakers were saying, that in nature everything varies, and even if we've had uh, a whole load of identical fields that are all treated in exactly the same way, um, we'd expect variation in species diversity and abundance within and between them, and that's because there are things that fundamentally differ between fields. Uh, so the soil, the aspect, the surrounding landscape, all those kind of things influence species diversity and the number of insects you're likely to find. Um, and so in order to understand how we need to manage those fields, we need to understand how, they are, how that variation uh, is taking place across the field and between fields. And for pests and beneficials, that's even more important because that variation can be really high, even at quite a, a small spatial scale. So even between tens of metres, you can find none, none of one set, and then a few metres later, you can find 10, 20 of them. Um, and this makes it quite difficult to, to really get a handle on what you need to do to manage particularly pests. Uh, and then even more so when you try and think about how you can take into account the influence of natural enemies in the, uh, in the management as well. Um, so I just wanted to kind of, that kind of sets the scene of how difficult some of these decisions can be. Uh, oh, 
sorry, I'm looking. So the idea of a decision support system is to help uh, make those decisions with confidence, uh, particularly so you know you're confident that you need to make uh, uh, take an action, so that might be applying an insecticide, or even more, where you make the decision not to take an action where none is needed. And obviously there are risks associated with both of those, but particularly where you're taking an action uh, where you decide not to apply a, a pesticide um, because you believe there's not going to be a pest. If that turns out to be incorrect and the pest turns up, that can cause quite a big problem to your crop. And so you need to be as confident as possible. And that's really where decision support systems come into play. And they're, they're there to design help you make those decisions. At the moment, and particularly for pests, there are fundamentally two types of decision support system. And I'll, I'll refer to them as DSS throughout this talk so you know what those are. Um, essentially, you've got forecasts, and these help you to decide whether the pest is going to arrive during a vulnerable, pe vulnerable period. Um, because if you know that the pest is going to arrive, but the, the crop isn't at a vulnerable growth stage, um, then you'd be fairly confident you don't need to do any more action. And really, this is helping you to make decisions without even going out into the crop um, and saving you an awful lot of time. If a forecast says that yes, there is a, a, a pest likely to arrive and the crop is vulnerable, then you need to go into crop and, and have a look and that's where thresholds and things like that come into play a bit more uh, and, and they can help you decide whether or not it's actually cost effective to um, to apply something. Now there are other kinds of support systems in development and available and um, there are various maps of, of observational data which are kind of like forecasts that tell you where things are already being seen um, and there are various uh, remote sensing software and things under, under development as well that can almost add even more detail to this. But these are the kind of fundamental types of systems that, that are available at the moment and um, you might be familiar with. So for example, uh, the AHDB has a BYDV management tool on their website. Um, and it's a fairly simple system. It, it works on the basis that uh, temperature affects uh, the flight times of, uh, of um, uh, aphids in the autumn um, and when you get to a point of it being warm enough or long enough they are likely to move around in the crop and spread BYDV and that's all that chart is, is telling you. I, I do recommend going to that again already and um, it's a useful uh, tool for, for showing you when and where to have a look um, for, for the aphids in your crop. And it, it just gives you that alert to go and have, have, a, uh, have a look. Um, and then there are thresholds, like I say, these are where you got into the crop and now you need to decide whether or not uh, to take an action. Um, this is a, a classic one that, that we talk about a lot, it's the pollen beetle uh, threshold and it uh, varies depending on the plant density which has a, a large effect on the, the number of pod, uh, pod, um, pods per meter squared. Um, again, I'm not going to go into this detail now, but just to make the point that there are these thresholds available um, and, and these are all kinds of decision support systems that are, are open access really. But alongside DSS, it's really important that you are going out and, and always have your look at your crop and double checking that the forecasts are accurate for your fields um, because they are based on averages, they are based on remote sense data, so they're not 100%. And um, so it's always worth going out and checking. And you always have to keep track of your crop condition anyway and growth stages. So, so it's just part of that is making sure that you are cross checking information that you're getting from DSS, but also observing pests and their natural enemies and getting a grasp of of what's really going on in the crop. Um, at the moment, I'm not aware of any DSS for pest management that really incorporate uh, natural enemy abundance into them. I suspect they will come in the future. Um, the difficulty with it is that you then need to collect quite a lot of data uh, on your farm to make, to, to make that feasible. Um, so it's just more time spent for you to collect those things and more time to then interpret what they mean as well. Um, and quite a lot of the thresholds do in some way account for population growth. So it, it's, it's there, but it's not, it's something that we're going to see more of in the future, I suspect. In terms of um, how you might monitor, the easiest thing is to go and just have a look, have a dig around in the soil, look at the crops, look and, and see what you can find. Don't worry too much if you don't know what it is, because there are plenty of uh, people like myself, and I'm sure Ben and many, many other entomologists who, if you send us a picture of something, we will try and tell you what it might be. Um, and it, it, we are always happy to jump at those opportunities. So do just go out, have a look, see what you can find. You can use pitfall traps, um, sticky traps, sweep netting, 
water traps and uh, if you want to buy some fancy kit um, then then do uh, but anything you can do just have a look and see what's out there and get familiar with the kind of things that are in your crops and around your crops because that'll really help you use the systems better um, we couldn't be in the field today but that doesn't mean we can't see some insects so uh, this is our hoverfly larvae chomping away on an aphid uh, and this is a ladybird larvae doing the same and I found these within about 10 minutes of, of walking around the crop uh, last week. So, and at the moment, there are loads of them around. Um, this happens to be a harlequin ladybird, which is the uh, non-native big bruiser. Um, and you'll probably find quite a lot of those. Uh, I don't know exactly what species of horrify it is, but, but um, I suspect it's the marmalade fly, which is a pretty common one. Um, I reckon it took them about five minutes to completely destroy those aphids. Um, I did watch. Uh, and that they can eat hundreds of aphids in their lifetime and then you've got loads of these around the crop. So, so do have a look and, and um, see what you can find. Uh, right, uh, in terms of monitoring, um, just harking back to what Ben was talking about, it's really important to monitor throughout the crop, not just along the edges, because you will get quite a skewed view if you look at just one edge. And um, the usual recommendation is this W pattern. Uh, obviously that's not possible during some parts of the times of the year in some crops uh, and it's quite a hassle even when you can walk freely through and um, so if you can't do the big W pattern then at least do a kind of one once along uh, a tram line close to the edge or once along the middle um, and, and that should give you a rough idea of what's going on in a bit more detail. Um, I just wanted to also flag up that we're doing a bit of work with AHDB at the moment on their strategic farms and um, they are um, installing some uh, floral strips kind of echoing what the ASSIST project is doing uh, and we'll be having a look at the effect of those over the next few years. Um, on the left, so what we've done is a bit of pitfall trapping in the autumn, we've just a couple of weeks ago done it as well, uh, again across the two farms, just to see, get us a kind of background idea of the kind of um, insects that are out there. Uh, so that in the future we can see how that changes when the, the, the strips can't start to establish. Um, so this is a really common um, ground beetle. Uh, it is going to move in a second, I promise. Um, and these are the ones you'll see darting across tram lines and across pathways um, quite frequently. Uh, and you can see quite a lot of them in this pitfall trap as well. Um, I studied these in my uh, in a bit of research about 10 years ago, and I was finding Honestly, hundreds of them per pitfall trap every few meters. They are really common in agricultural land and they do a really good job of picking up anything that will drop off the crop, anything they can catch. Um, so it's worth keeping a lookout for them and getting familiar with them for sure. And this is what the, um, the beetle banks are really good for, for promoting. Um, can we get, so I, I'm gonna just get to the answer of those, the, the polls now and see what people say. So, these are, the, these are the things that we thought might be restricting people's use of DSS. Um, uh, so um, that's the poll from the first question. Is it, can we get the second poll up? So we've got a good breakdown of people on this call. We've got, um, I'd say about a dozen farmers, a dozen agronomists, a dozen researchers, and then a few others. Um, great, thank you. So uh, can you all see, can everyone see the results there that should have popped up for you? And clearly the most common um, limitation seems to be that people are unaware of the, the availability of these systems. Um, but there is a smattering across the rest of the responses as well. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. I'm going to print screen it because I really want to use it later. Bear with me. High tech stuff, print screen and paste. So, um, so the response isn't surprising at all. Uh, we, we know that a lot of people aren't aware of the kind of range of systems that are out there to support um, IPM decisions. And in fact, I asked the same question a few months ago uh, as another presentation. Um, and actually that presentation was much more to developers and researchers. And you can see that um, it was a small number of people, it's only 20 people, but we, we didn't get that spike in the unaware because people, researchers and developers already knew about these things. Uh, and we had fewer farmers and agronomists in the room. So it, it does depend on who you talk to, obviously, how this came out. Although the, the risk averse element does seem to be low in both, um, in both groups. So what, um, what's the point of this? Well, 
we have a project that started last year. This is the IPM Decisions Project, um, and we are aiming to increase the impact of on-farm decision support systems for IPM. So what we're trying to do is get people using these systems and get them more effective at helping IPM implementation um, across agriculture, across Europe. We're going to develop two things. One is going to be an online platform uh, where you'll be able to go and find these systems and use them and mess around with them, play with them, and get them working for you. Uh, and we'll also be creating a network so that we can actually talk to people who are using the systems and talk to developers and get them connected so that in future these systems are, are really reflecting the needs of people out in the field. And there are going to be four platforms. I can always through this, but I know I'm going to run out of time. Um, there are going to be four different dashboards for different types of users. So whether you're a farmer, a researcher, um, a developer, um, you, you can go to a different part. But the main thing, main one that most people interact with is the uh, farmer and advisor system. Uh, and that'll be the one that basically enables you to find and use system, uh, support systems. We ran some workshops earlier this year, um, and these are designed to help us get feedback from people who are going to use the system, so that what we design is actually something that people want to use and can use. And that was the first wave of workshops. We will be having some more later this year or the start of 2021, depending on how lockdowns go. Um, you will hopefully be aware of them when we will advertise them quite widely. Um, and you're all very welcome to attend these and give some feedback on, on how you want us to develop the project. At the moment, what we expect the system to do is to enable you to um, set up your, your uh, user interface by selecting the crops that you're interested in. And then when you log back in, you'll be able to see which ones are at risk for various reasons based on forecasts and, and things like that already in, in, the, uh, in the platform. So you can see here that we've got a kind of mock-up. Um, and in this case, it says that there's a high risk associated with wheat crops. You'll be able to click on your wheat crop and you'll see all the pests that are in there. Here it says, right, the high risk is the septoria. So you click on septoria and it gives you a breakdown of why there's a high risk alert for that crop. Um, and this is all driven by various systems behind it. This is a very basic user interface. We, we've just sort of mocked up to show the point, but this is where we're heading with it. And this is where we need your feedback. So we make sure that how this looks and how it works is, is something that you will be happy to use. Um, behind the scenes as well, we'll be doing some uh, various validation exercises to make sure that the evidence behind those uh, systems is transparent. So that when you're looking at the results of a, a decision support system, you can have confidence that you know whether it's been validated in the UK, whether it's actually got some data behind it, whether it's a, a useful prediction system. Um, and we'll be creating this, this, this network across Europe to help sustain it uh, into the future. Sorry about that. Uh, and I've jumped out. So I think that's pretty much the end. Have I run out of time, Lucy? Yeah, you're out of time. Great. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Thank you so much. That was absolutely um, great. Lots of good information. I know in my um, very small experience of exploring decision support design, which is peeling aphids off yellow sticky traps, um, it's uh, really labour intensive and time consuming. So the better communicated and connected networks that we can make these individual findings, the more efficient and effective the use of everyone's precious time. Um, no specific questions have come through for Mark in the chat, um, but there are moving on now to, uh, we, we've got about 10 minutes left to have a bit of a conversation between everyone. Um, and kind of one of the areas that's, that's come up for us in preparing for this, uh, call today is talking about how the introduction of beneficial insects James raised on Twitter last week um, a, a feature from a, an Ely farmer Tom Clark releasing lacewing larvae into his sugar beet field for, for the control of Mises persicae and there is a real issue in sugar beet due to both resistance and the withdrawal of actives at the moment and um, can I ask Alistair if he sees this really as a, a new age for biological control, introduced biological control in the field. Is, is this a reality in, in arable? Well, I'd suggest it's a new age of optimism for anybody doing that. I certainly have experience for uh, using inundation techniques in, in, in glass houses to control uh, white fly and, and, and red spider mite. Uh, much easier when you've got a roof on the building. Um, out in the field, I would suggest probably unpredictable and costly. 
and I go back really to, to, to you know the importance of creating the right habitat so that nature takes care of this by itself. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. That's a, that's a, um, that's a great answer. Um, I'm going to ask Ben now, just kind of, I think this is probably a conversation starter rather than a definitive answer. And um, just to start off, of, of these areas of IPM that we talked about, these eight areas, um, where do you feel currently that the broadest, the greatest opportunities lie within this quite broad spectrum of, of IPM strategies? Where are you seeing real advances com coming forward for Arable? Uh, to be honest with you, from my we might sit a little bit outside of this, but I'm seeing the advances that probably sit in terms of automatic recognition of uh, pests. So there's a lot of this is used in fruit crops at the moment, where they use um, uh, small cameras basically linked to um, uh, phones to basically use um, image recognition to identify pests. Now, I think that's, that's a great thing to do. But where I think the, the jump will come in terms of arable systems is where we can link that recognition to the development of predator populations. If we can do this, we can show real-time tracking between pest populations and predator populations and provide farmers with actual information pertinent to their crop. The issue that I see with IPM is that farmers have a hard time trusting it simply for the reason that it's unpredictable it's exactly what Alistair said earlier on it varies on a fill by fill basis and I think until we get to that point where farmers can have real time up to the date information on where their predator population sits and how it's tracking pests it's going to be a hard situation to try and implement a lot of this in a in a robust way for a lot of farmers it's easier for those that are thinking ahead but I think for a lot of people they, they still have that background reliance on chemical control understandably is reliable and we need to bridge that gap and that's that's a big emphasis on researchers in my opinion i know that kind of didn't answer your question but that's how i, I kind of see it going into the future that's a good answer. i was gonna just ask james to come in there as a as a real life farmer is, is that a fair point would you say i yeah i think it is a, um, a fair point um but this is why we're all here you know to research these things and find a way forward um, so I agree with that. I've also got a question really for um, Alistair and Ben. In terms of, um, particularly when we're renewing our countryside stewardship, the habitat that we want to put forward for these agreements, what I get confused with is exactly what options we need to be putting forward for beneficials. Is it a one-year rotation option or is it a five-year AB8 flower-rich um, option? I wonder if they could expand on that. I said, do you want to go first? Yeah, where to, where to look for guidance on the. On I'm the sorry, my sound broke up in that, so I, I didn't catch the whole question. Apologies. But where, where can farmers look for guidance on which options? Like having having made that decision and being really really keen to make um make make progress in this area. Where can we look to for, I guess it's, it's looking towards what Mark's doing in terms of decision support, but over a longer time frame, perhaps, you know, what, what, where can James go to to get guidance on which countryside stewardship, for instance, options really most beneficial for beneficials? Yeah, now that's a really good question, actually, um, because I don't think those lines have been joined up yet. You know, we've got... Uh, and I would revert you back to John Holland and some of those charts that I presented there. I wasn't able to go through them in detail, but quite clearly he's now drilled down into which options are good for which species. But what I don't think you'll find is a countryside stewardship advisor that can help you join those up. They, they will tell you where to put bits of habitat around the field, which make economic sense for the farmer without looking at the crop rotation the farmer's growing and, and at what stage you need to have particular predators and pests um, interacting. And I'm afraid, again, I wasn't able to, to, to have time to show everything today, but, but John's also done some great work on density, diversity and distribution of these predators within the field, showing how they flux through the season. So we've got a niche in the market there for any advisors who are listening today. Um, I, I've just got one, we're really running out of time. 
pretty predictably. Um, but I've just got one more question I'd like to ask to Mark, please, which is the importance of economic thresholds really comes up across this, across this piece. Um, and, and that's quite a lot of complicated assumptions involved in deciding a, a, an economic threshold for crop protection. So I just quickly ask, um, who makes these and, and are they being reviewed? Do they change over time? Is this an evolving science? Yeah, they're definitely an evolving science and you have to remember that um, most of the work behind thresholds is either done on the experience of people who work in the field or they're done based on uh, trials and field, field work specifically. Either way it's done on uh, quite a limited data set um, and it's always kind of trying to find the best point amongst the variation of data. So the, the, there is no an economic threshold is kind of your very best guess at a number but if you just treat them as a number um, then there's a danger you're going to miss, miss uh, the point of it. And it's much better to use it in the context of what you know is going on on your farm. So they're, they're most valuable when you are regularly looking at um, numbers and seeing how numbers are changing over time, and then use the threshold as something to, to compare against rather than a hard and fast rule. Thanks. And, we, and we've got no time, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. They are being updated for sure. Now, this is just the beginning. I can see us revisiting this. Um, I've enjoyed today. Um, my, my parting thoughts from this conversation, my, my take home from today, is that this progressive and progressing of IPM and arable is not really a luxury, it's not an option, it's not a nice to have, it is the direction of travel um, that's going to enable UK arable to continue to grow the cereals and oil seeds that really underpin not only our farming landscape but also our food landscape actually. Um, and I'm, I'm going to thank all of you involved, everyone who's come and all our participants um, for your part in making this a reality um, and taking this forward. Um, there are more field days, as Alice there mentioned. Uh, if you go to the Agricology website, um, there's a wealth of resources um, and information about upcoming events. Um, I will personally email everybody who's been here today with a link to this recording. Um, and yeah thanks so much you know where leaf is you know what we do um i'll, I'll check with the uh with the panelists to see if they would be willing to be contacted individually and um, with any questions i don't know if that's something i can ask now mark ben james alistair yep. no problem uh, yes no an issue great yeah. okay Very i'll happy. send you i'll also i'll pass out there emails with a follow-up in, in my follow-up email and you can contact them if there's anything we haven't answered today. Um, thank you for making the time. Thank you very much to my technical assistants who, um, without whom I really don't think we could have pulled this off quite so smoothly. And also thank you to Alice Midmer who's been with us today um, for actually coming up with the bright idea in the first place and to Tim and Charlie Chamberlain for being willing to host us on their farm. We look forward to being there in real life as soon as possible, all things being well. So thank you very much. Um, and unless there's any final questions, I'm not seeing anything coming up. Emily, is there anything outstanding on the chat? Nothing outstanding. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna end the meeting now and say goodbye. Thank Have you. a good rest of your goodbye. day. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Lucy. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.